It is Wednesday afternoon. I almost said Genesis 23. I am really doing well. Roger, start us again. <laughs> okay. It is Wednesday afternoon, August 23rd in the year 23, 2023, and we are picking up in Bereshit Genesis, not 23, but 25. <laughs> in fact, we're really picking up in about 25 and verse 25, so that's easy to remember also. We are looking at Rivka, Rebecca giving... Uh, are we on 26? I'm still at 25. We're in 25. We're doing a slight review that leads into the complete thoughts for today. Okay, so we're, we saw in 23, verse 23, I'm sorry, staying in chapter 25, we saw in verse 23 that, that there was a war going on in, in Rebecca's tummy while she was pregnant. And she took it to the Lord wondering what was wrong and he said that there are two nations in your womb. Two peoples that will be separated. One will be stronger than the other, the older will serve the younger, not the norm. The norm is for the older to have that head position. So God has acknowledged to her what is going on. He is showing that he is choosing. He is choosing, I believe, according to his foreknowledge, knowing the hearts that he makes it clear that he chose before they did anything. It was not by their merit or by their demerits that he was choosing. But I do believe that he, knowing what their character is going to be like and what they were going to be like, he was choosing and putting into motion. We see a number of times in Scripture, Avraham wasn't the oldest. Um, Reuben was not the oldest. Yosef wasn't the oldest. David, David wasn't the oldest. Solomon wasn't the oldest. God does not always choose the oldest in that position. It is the rule of thumb just as the, the usual of the passing down through the family is usually to the oldest, but it can be, exceptions can be made. We'll go on and look at that a bit more when we look at the birthright and the blessing that goes along with it. In verse 25 last week, we learned that Esau was named so because he was hairy, and Esau means hairy. He was also red or reddish in his appearance, uh, this was a rough, this was a like a man of the earth, a natural man, and we're going to see that he is more like Cain, Cain in contrast to Avel, who was more, you know, he was the shepherd and brought the sheep, where Cain brought the fruit of his labor from the land. Here, it, it, the idea in this, in verse um, 27, we'll even see it more, it's more of a sign of an excessive uh, sensual vigor, a wilderness, a, a rough guide, you know, this this is a man of the world, a man of the wilderness. In his appearance, remember he's just being born, he hasn't had a chance to do anything yet, but very often the names were according to what was going on at the birth. So Esau comes out, Harry in appearance, he gets named Harry. His brother is going to be named for what he is doing. He has his hand holding on to his brother's heel, or reaching out. And so he is going to be named Yaakov, which means heel catcher, or holding to the heel. That's literally what's being meant. Uh, it also is given the, the word supplanter. We see that in chapter 27 and verse 36 when Esau refers to his brother in that way. But the word supplanter, that now means to supersede and to replace, was not necessarily that meaning then, although Esau used it in a negative manner that caught on and has continued. But this is what's called the etymology of a word. And you have to get back to the root of the word. And last week I told you that subplanta, the two words that are put together for supplanter, simply meant under the sole of the foot. That's where Jacob, Jacob, was found, under the sole of Esau's foot. So that's how he got named. In Hebrew, the word for heel is akev. And when you hear akov, Yaakov, and akev, you can hear how closely the two words are related. We have vowel markings that give us the different words, but the, the root is right there. Now, Jewish legend hear the word legend, okay? Jewish legend says that every time Rebecca got near an idol's altar, that Esau got all excited in the womb. And every time she got near an altar for God, 
Jacob got excited in the womb. <laughs> now, I want to ask you, how would she even know which one? <laughs> and what were they doing near any idolatrous altars? So I'm not one who buys into this, but the idea was that there was contention between these two right from the beginning. Now, we don't know why Yaakov had a hold of the hill. We don't know if it's as they want to say that he was trying to grab his brother back and get out first. That's putting a lot to me in my mind on a, on a <clears throat> newborn infant. It, you know, if you see a newborn infant their first day of life, I don't think we've ever seen one that has that kind of attitude. You know, it just doesn't fit in my mind. But you can take it as you want. I'm going to give you more commentary on the name and the meaning of why this is important today before you go make up any of your decisions. But I'll encourage you to stay as close to the Word of God and what you see from Him as possible. Remember, God's in the choosing, and God is in control in all of the details, no matter what man does or thinks he's doing. If you look um, with me, in fact, let's look there real quickly at Hosea, Hosea, chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. His take on this was that this was a strength. This was not a negative. This was more of a positive. In Hosea, Hosea, chapter 12, verse 3, he said, in the womb, uh, sorry, I, my, I moved my tablet. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel. In the strength of his manhood, he fought with God. Okay, we know that he uh, wrestled with the angel of God. That's what Hosea is referring to. But he refers to both times as a strength. He, in Hosea's mind, Yaakov was showing that he was of a strong character from his birth. That was his point in what he was saying. Now again, in all fairness with all scriptures, we see in Genesis 27, 36, and we'll go ahead and go there on the way back to Genesis chapter 25, where we're studying in um, Genesis 27. I'm trying to get my tablet to work again. Sorry, folks, we've got little glitches in the house today that we're going to conquer. In chapter 27, all the way down at verse 36, when Esau is angry with his brother, he says, then he said, is he not rightly named Jacob, Yaakov? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he's taken away my blessing. And then he goes on. Now, Esau is mad. He is calling it as he sees it. He is not necessarily speaking truth. Again, we'll deal with what he's saying that, that Jacob did wrong at the time when we get to chapter 27, but I will ask you to keep an open mind because you may have heard many a sermon that really shreds Jacob in his character and puts blame, I think, where it does not belong. I will say that at this point. I won't say any more on that because I want to back up and tell you a bit more. Why do we care about this? Um, let me just jump in and say it this way. My Jewish people have been harried, they've been harassed, they've been driven out of a country, out of another country, they've been rounded up and they've been killed. They've been accused of being schemers, cheaters, supplanters, and masters of deceit. And very often with those words that I've chosen carefully to use, they will follow just like their ancestor, Jacob. This opens a whole can of worms. This is anti-Semitism that is there. The same way that I hear, even among believers today, oh, they're the Christ killers. They deserve whatever they get. They shouldn't have anything because they killed Christ. They put him on the cross. They denied their Messiah. God's done with them. I don't want anything to do with them either. Now, we know that's not true. We know none of that is true. And I'm not here to defend and say every Jewish person lives an exemplary life. Every Jewish person does everything right. There's never been a Jew that's done anything wrong. No, I'm not here to say that. I will say that that's across the board no matter what race you choose. There's good and there's bad in both. But what I will say is that we want to handle our scriptures carefully and with truth. And we want to present the picture as truthfully as we possibly can. So when they use scriptures to justify Jewish hatred, when they use scriptures to justify the persecution of Jews, this is why we need to speak against it. 
And one way it starts is by saying, see, those Jews, you can't trust them. They deceive you. That's in their bloodline. That's what Jacob did. And this is why we need to stand against that, because if we don't speak up, then atrocities happen. The Holocaust happened because people did not speak up. Not alone, that's not the only reason, but that's one reason. God used it. He brought Israel out of it. But it's still not where we want to be a part of, of speaking against something that God has not spoken against in that way. And I will caution you when you think about it, how did God refer to Jacob? And if you don't know, when I get done with this, I will put it into the scripture's language. I will tell you exactly what God says of Jacob. But at this point, I want to say that a lot of times when they look at these stories that take place between chapter 25 and 27 with the birthright, with the blessing, many of those who are speaking don't know anything of the Jewish background. They don't know the traditions. They don't know what the birthright means. They, they don't know any of this, and so they can jump to conclusions without knowing. That's why we research and we go into the depth of the Jewish um, way of life at that time, that we go into what it means from the Jewish perspective so that we get a more balanced uh, view of what's accurate according to the Word of God. So let me tell you a little bit about that birthright that did traditionally go to the oldest set. There would also be a blessing that goes along with the birthright. They are not the same thing. Okay, and I'll, I'll make that clear as I go on. But inherent in the birthright was that, that position of headship for the entire family. So in, in the case of Esau and Jacob, the one who is going to receive the birthright will be the one who heads the clan that belonged to Abraham and to Isaac, now will belong to the one of God's choosing and continue on down into the, the line that leads to our Messiah. This one will oversee the household. This one will call the shots for the family. This one will say this is what the family is going to do. That they make all the decisions that have to do with their wealth, with their work, all of that, but it especially also includes, they call it spiritually how it's going to happen. Whether they're going to worship the one true and living God of Israel, whether they're not, it's this head person of the family that sets this all in motion. So when you see that, you see how important it is. This is Abraham's offspring. This is the line to the Messiah, to the promised seed. What's critically important is the spiritual side. Far more important really than the physical blessings and, and all that go along with the birthright and that are going to be, we'll, we'll be discussing. So if we follow the normal, Esau should have had that position. He should have had the overseeing of the household. That should have been his job. Where do we find Esau in scripture? Do we see him at all heading up and leading in his household? No. Remember when Laban, Lavan stepped out and along with his father talked to the servant about Rebekah and helped make the decision? Lavan was stepping into that birthright role as the oldest son in his family, helping out his dad in those decisions. His dad could have been aged, he could have been sickly, it could have been for a number of reasons, but it also would be the training of that son as he's coming along so that when he does take that position, he's well acquainted with how to, to carry out that position. So Esau should have been being seen in training for that position, would it be that he was to have it? Instead, we find him in the field. Keep that in mind, because we're going to see that there's a, another meaning for being out in the field also. But his general lifestyle is showing that he had a contempt for his birthright. He had no desire for it, and we're even told in chapter 25 and verse 34, we're not there yet, but if you take a sneak peek down there, this is what Esau thought about his birthright. And the word is despised. He didn't value it. He wasn't neutral about it. He despised his birthright. He didn't want the responsibilities. He didn't want what all he should be doing. So keep that in mind, okay? Now, some will excuse Esau for exchanging his birthright for the bowl of stew or lentils. I'll describe what that is in a moment. But that's an excuse that they give. Oh, 
Jacob took advantage of him. He was starving to death. Really? <laughs> Let's look a little closer at our hunter who is out in the field hunting. Let me tell you that they, he didn't even have to hunt in the field. They had flocks, they had cattle. There was ability to have food right within their own um, realm. You know, he's hunting by choice. It's a game to him. He's his father's favor. That's why he honored his father. He honored his father's request to go out. Yes. We're going to look at when we get there. Why did Isaac request that? What does that tell us about Yitzhak? Where he was at? What does all that mean? Because there's more meaning than just the surface words. And I'm trying not to tell you all I will as we unfold the story. But I can tell you that very likely, you know, they were dwelling in tents. And if I take you back to tent time, tent city, <laughs> the way that life was, they didn't have a kitchen. They didn't walk into the kitchen to a stove and put a pan on the burner and cook dinner, okay? They had a boiling pot outside of the tent that would be going 24-7. This would always be going. In that pot was a common denominator basic food, a stew, lentils, you know, call it what you will, the scripture calls it lentils. Esau could easily, on his way into his brother's tent, help himself to what was on the fire right outside the tent door. He was not in a place of inability to get to food. He was not starving to death. What he's determined here is he's going to make his little brother serve him. Now, because of that, I think already in his mind was, I know that I'm supposed to serve my brother. No way, Jose. He's going to serve me. And he's trying to flaunt that and deal with that uh, in the matter of what's going on at that moment. Now, keep all of that in mind and go to Rebecca, go to Rivka and her role. She was trying to ensure that what she had been told when she was carrying the two was what would happen. She was told the younger was to receive that birthright blessing because that younger was to, to rule and the older was not. And so she made the same mistake that her mother-in-law made. Who is Rebecca's mother-in-law? Sarah. Sarah. What did Sarah do? She, she handed Hagar over to Abraham, here, have seed by her, have a baby with her so that we can get, you know, God's plan on the road. She's <laughs> trying to help God. Rebecca stepped in it too. She's trying to help God. She knows what God's plan is. She knows what God's will is. But she makes the mistake of not letting God work out the problem. She tries to help God along. Any of us see ourselves there? <laughs> oh, we know what problem we've got, and this would make a great solution. God said, please bless it, let it happen. And then we have to think, are we pulling a Sarah or a Rebecca? Because it, it's all too easy for all of us in that position to want to do that. Now, Jacob was of a character that was not weak. He was not the he-man of the world. He wasn't the hunter of the world, but he was not a wimpy little ha <laughs> and didn't know how to do anything for himself. He's taking care of the home front. He even seems to be the major chef for the family, which we're going to tie into the spiritual feeding of the prophets when we get to that point in the scripture also. But the thing that Yaakov wanted most was the thing that Esau despised, and that was the birthright. What he was wanting is that position with God, and he was trying to hold on to it and prevail for it. Right or wrong with how he did it, that was his intent. He wanted that covenant relationship with Almighty God that would be his in the position of birthright being given to him. So I'm not going to say he's all right. I'm not going to say, you know, you can read and you can see and you can understand and as we go through these two chapters by the time we get to the end of 27 I think you'll be able to discern for yourselves who really was acting right who wasn't and I will tell you nobody does it right 100% of the time okay but God still uses them 
And when we get to that final, if you have not picked up, and before I give you just a little bit more on the birthright and the blessing and the differences between them, let me remind you, when you want to speak ill against Jacob and call him the deceiver and the schemer and say that, that you know he was so terrible stealing from his brother, etc., etc., then remember how God speaks of Jacob. And God in Scripture says, Jacob, whom I have loved. Now, I did explain to you when he says Esau, he's hated. It's not a literal hate. It is such a comparison and contrast of the love that he's got with Jacob in that spiritual realm that it looks as if Esau's hated because he's just left out of that spiritual realm. That God does not hate anyone. For God so loved the world. Do you read in there, for God so loved the world except Esau? <laughs> no. So you have to understand, God's not saying, I literally hate Esau. It's not a matter of that kind of jealousy that, that families sometimes have a favorite and despise another. That God was honoring the love of Jacob's heart for him, for the spiritual, for the intent to lead the family spiritually. That's where these two we're in sync and of course when Jacob's in sync with the Lord then he'll do things in the right way but we see him very much in his flesh at times too very much like his mom very much like Sarah very much like Avraham he made mistakes too remember he let Sarah be taken in the harem he took a chance on what would happen to her womb God protected God's in control so let me also give you just a, a bit of a background on the birthright and the blessing. So for that, we're going to look at chapter 25. We're going to look at verses 19 to 34 in, in, in totality. But because we've already read some of them, let me just give you background, bring you into it, and explain the differences. So again, in our background, Rebecca struggled with the two in the womb. God explained the conflict that was going on saying that the older is going to serve the younger. We saw that Esau was named Harry. He's later called Edom, which means red. It's very interesting that Esau, a ruddy, reddish complected, sells his birthright for what's called red food. It's food of the earth, okay? And the name Edom becomes a term of contempt. So the same way that they want to make Jacob a term of contempt, really the name that becomes contemptible is Edom. Um, Esau was so consumed with hunting, with plundering, you know, he was so full of just the physical that he looks at, at the food and he doesn't even call it by his name. He just says, basically, give me some of that red stuff. Let me cram it down my throat. I'm starving to death. He was just all in his physical, all in, uh, in his um, natural self. Uh, and his comment that he was going to die could be looked at in several ways. One, he could have thought, I'm living a rough life, I'm out there being threatened by wild animals, I could be killed at any time. Another could have been the same way that we say, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. Really? <coughs> really, you wanna go out and get a horse and start eating the horse because you're hungry? Or how many of us have even said, I'm so hungry, I'm gonna die if I don't get food, and you think you're starving to death. But we know that we're all on hyperbole. We know that we're, exclaiming larger than life. Remember that, that Aesop was not about to die. He didn't know when he would die. He might have even been meaning, what good is that birthright going to be to me when I'm dead? So who cares about it? Because he just did not have a spiritual note in his body. Now, what about this birthright? Okay. Technically, you would think it belongs to Aesop, except for the fact that God said it wouldn't. I've already explained to you the honor goes to the first uh, born to be the head of the household. They, that one would inherit the father's estate. He would inherit a double portion of everything that's being passed down. So whatever would be split, it's not like we tend to do today where all the siblings get an equal amount. The head one would get a double portion. That recipient also had double responsibilities at least and that's one reason for this double blessing that he's going to receive if the father had two or more wives by the way because we see that many a time in scripture the firstborn of the first wife 
is the one who would receive the the double inheritance, the birthright. The the father, the husband couldn't say, oh, I like wife number three better. It's going to be her firstborn. No, it would be his first wife and the first wife's firstborn. Just to put it in order, that's according to Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. You can read that on your own, so I won't bother to read it to you now. But that double portion, we see six times in Scripture, we see a reference to this double portion. Hannah could not have children. She was in agony over not having children. Her husband loved her. He tried to assuage her grief by blessing her double. He gave her a double portion above his other wife. That's first Shmuel for Samuel chapter one and verse five. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. He wanted to make up for the lack she was feeling. At the end of Eliyahu's life, Elijah's life, he offers his assistant, Elisha, El, 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 sorry, Elisha in our English. He offers him a gift. Elisha's request was to be considered the successor of Eliyahu, but he wanted to be doubly blessed with the power that Elijah had in his prophetic office. So he's saying, give me a double blessing spiritually. And we see from, El from Elisha's life, Elisha's life between the two, I get tongue twisted. We see, if you read the book of 2 Kings, he seemed to receive a double portion, double the miracles and so much that he did um, that was confirmed in his lifetime as the prophet that, pre that followed Elijah. So he seemed to get that double portion. Israel is promised a double portion. For all who want to say God's done with Israel, I want us to read because I want you to see it with your eyeballs. It's a beautiful chapter. We're only going to read one verse. I'm going to take you to Yeshayahu, that is Isaiah chapter 61, and we're going to look at verse 7. Read that chapter though, it's a beautiful chapter, it's talking about Messiah in the beginning, the Spirit of the Lord God's upon me, Isaiah 61. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to his afflicted. Yeshua fulfilled those words in his lifetime. This is a beautiful Messianic prophecy, but it also refers to Israel. Verse 3, to grant those who mourn in Zion. In Zion. That was the name for Israel. Now when you drop down to verse 7, knowing he's talking to Israel, it says, instead of your shame, you will have a double portion. Instead of humiliation, they will shout for joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in their land. Everlasting joy will be theirs. Now, for every believer who wants to say that they have everlasting joy in their life with the Lord forever, if God can sell Israel, I'm going to give you everlasting joy. And then he's going to cut that off. What does that do to that Christian who's saying, I've got everlasting joy in the presence of the Lord forever. You would have to say, as long as God doesn't change his mind. <laughs> the hallelujah, our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he keeps his word faithfully. Is Israel receiving everlasting joy right now? No. Is she in a position to? No, she is rebellious. All of Israel isn't the Israel that will receive the blessing because not all of Israel is spiritual Israel. The, the Israel that is going to turn to her God, follow her God, be led by her God, will go into the millennial blessings and the forever everlasting joy. But you don't get that everlasting joy just by being a Jew, any more than you do by just being a Gentile. You enter into the everlasting joy when you enter into covenant relationship with, uh, with the God, of, the living God of Israel, which we know Yeshua, Jesus said, the way to him is through me, through my shed blood. But notice how Israel has a promise forever. Also, Yaov, Job, chapter 42 and verse 10, in the end, he received a double portion. He got double everything except the number of children because each life is precious. You can't double children and say you, you, it makes up for it. But in every other way, excuse me, Job was blessed with a double portion. Now, 
that can also be used one time we see it in scripture where it's a double portion referring to judgment this is revelation 18 6 and this is a judgment against babylon for how simple she was her cup of iniquity so full that god pours out his full wrath he pours out a double portion of judgment upon her and i'm referring to revelation 18 and verse 6 where it says pay her back even as she has paid give back to her double according to her deeds in a cup which she has mixed mix twice as much for her so in that case it's double trouble she's going to receive double for for how evil she has been back on track with the birth right now they, they get a double portion um before i explain what i think i have explained what all that is but i'll hit it again if i didn't anyway um the king's firstborn the one who would normally be in succession to the throne would receive a double portion. It didn't matter if you're in the king's house or in a poor house, you know. They also would receive that double portion. But it's very interesting that we do see exceptions here also. King Rehoboam, Shlomo's son, Solomon's son, he was king of Judah, Judah, and he violated the giving of the path of the birthright to the oldest son he gave it to his favorite son um you say abijah in english he paid his older son off and then gave the birthright to abijah so it does not mean just because you're in the king's household it's going to go the way it's supposed to be rehoboam rehoboam king rehoboam did not um and let's see um Okay, I think, I think I've given you enough examples. After the father would die, in the absence of the father, if he's too ill to carry on, that firstborn assumes all authority, but also all responsibilities. The Bible does show us times when the father could choose another one, could say, my oldest is not responsible. My oldest is not in a good place for this. I'm not going to give it to my oldest. I will give it to and name another son. The father had the right to do that. God had the right to choose Jacob over Esau, whether he gave that right to the earthly fathers or not, but we see it in that same way. And uh, often when a father would reject the older, it was because the older would be like Esau, despising his birthright. Here's where I'll begin to open your mind to question, should Yitzhak have been wanting to give the birthright to Esau? Where was Esau? The importance being the spiritual. He's looking at his two sons. What should he have been wanting to do? Okay, just a thought question for you at this point in time as we go through it in chapter 27. We will deal with it, and a lot of people miss Yitzhak's response in the end, but it's quite telling, and I will bring it out to you when we get there. Make you want to come back? <laughs> okay, so birthright. Double blessing, head of the house, household. By the way, if um, the, the father does die, the widow is taken care of by that eldest son that received the birthright. It's his responsibility to take care of mama all the rest of her days. If there are daughters in the house and they don't marry, the oldest one, the one with the birthright, would take care of the daughters all the days of their lives. That's why he was given a double portion. So he would have something to give to the others who were in need in the household. It wasn't to make him, I'm so rich and you don't get. It was so that he'd have to be able to take care of the needs of the family. He had much responsibility along with it and it would be, it would follow him continually. Yes? Is this done like, like uh, if he's dying, he brings in the family and he tells very often it was done in that way. I'll give you a sneak peek. Genesis 49. Jacob thinks he's dying and he blesses his 12 sons. That's the blessing. And in that blessing, the blessing will have three parts usually. It'll have words of encouragement. It will have details regarding their inheritance, what that son's to get. And then in patriarchal days, it would also have that prophetic word that that Jacob spoke over his sons prophetically what would happen with his sons' lives, and he nails it all the way with all 12. How could anybody do that? Because it was God-given. It was prophecy from, from God channeled through the father to the sons. 
So we see Genesis 49. It'll be a little while before we get there. <laughs> but we'll see a prime example. Yes, yes. Very often near death, they bring them in, go through it, and it was something that they, they really um, honored. And, you know, they, they, they respected it, highly respected it. Yes, Patty. Um, would that be the same case for um, when Jesus died, he asked John to take care of Mary? Very Instead good. Very good. I thought you were going to another side, which I'll bring up, but even that side is true also. Yes, when Yeshua was dying on the cross and he saw his mother and he asked Yohanan John, to, in essence, put your arm around my mother. He was giving the responsibilities of the oldest son to another one because he knew he wasn't going to be able to carry it out. So yes. But what about his other brothers? And then his, his Again, brothers. God follows, he does not follow, he puts into effect a normal, but it doesn't mean he doesn't have exceptions. Yeshua's brothers were not believers. They didn't believe until after Yeshua raised from the dead. James, his brother, comes to great faith, becomes a pillar in the church. But at the time of Yeshua is dying on the cross, he's not going to want to turn his mother over to one of his brothers who has been against him and doesn't, hasn't believed in him, doesn't realize who he is. And here's Yochanan, who does love him, who ha I'm sure had a love for, his, for Yeshua's mother. And it, he would be the perfect candidate to say, take care of my mom. Not not the original, no. Not the twelve that you find listed when he called them. No. Yeah, those are different. No. Yes. There are two. There there's even more than two in scripture. Mm -hmm. There's four Marys. I don't remember how many James, but anyway, there there's more, yes. No. The Talmudim that followed Yeshua, the twelve, they were not his brothers. Um, his brothers show up only at one point with his mother when he's, Yeshua is in the house doing his miracle and he's told, you know, your, your mother and your brothers are outside, they're calling for you. Because basically, in, in today's vernacular, they hear you kind of getting off the path here and they're worried about you and they want to, you know, come on, come home with me, let's get you straightened out again. You know, they were opposing what he was doing. They were not recognizing who he was. But when he raised from the dead that authority that, that gave him life everlasting in humanity's form also that they saw, that one at least James over and, and I hope the rest of his kin folk also. Could they have been jealous of Jesus? Too? Very easily. Can you imagine too, let's, let's just be blatantly <laughs> honest. If you've got siblings in the family and one kid is very obedient and very good, and the other kids are constantly getting into trouble and doing things. What happens between them? Oh, that's goody two-shoes, and they don't like them, and they, you know, issues and words go back and forth. And, of course, that, that goody two-shoes wasn't living a perfect life, but just, you know, maybe wasn't, didn't have that rebellious nature, you know, wasn't going against the parents as much. Can you imagine having a sibling who was perfect? never did anything wrong, always did it right, you know, always being praised by the parents, you know, always head and shoulders above them. He's doing his father's business when he's 12 years of age. This probably is, is the idea of where, well, I can't say that, but now I'll, I'll rescind it. I was going to say where they get the idea of our myths being boys at that age, but they weren't believing in Yeshua, so it's not the example they'd follow, but we can see that and say, you know, even at a very young age, he was mindful of the spiritual work he needed to do. It had been hard to live with him in human flesh. You're always being <coughs> shown up short, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I'm sure he loved them. I'm sure he was not flaunting it. That's not who our Lord was. That would be sin, and he never sinned. Yeah, but, but Mary, I'm sure, told her of the children, and she never, never, you know, even spoke to him about about that situation that their older brother was not really from God. Who knows what she told them? Who knows what they were able to understand? Mm -hmm. She was trying to understand a lot on her own. That you know, she she wasn't understanding herself. You know, it says that she hid these things in her heart. She thought about them. You know, she was trying to contemplate and understand. I don't think she realized at the time of his birth that he was going to grow up and die 
and she'd be watching her son being crucified. You know, who knows what she taught. I think that she was an excellent parent because I don't think God put Yeshua into the hands of anything less than excellent parents, you know, earthly. Uh, you know, not God, but earthly. Exactly, I think he was. I think that he had died before, and that I can't prove that scripture silent. Whereas talking about Mary's husband, um, earthly husband, you know, but he's he had to be out of the picture so that the focus of Yeshua's father is the Father in heaven, not the earthly father. But uh, um, I just the fact that he was willing to take her, not put her to shame, provide for her, shows his character. The fact that God could awaken him in a dream and say, take the mother and baby, go into Egypt for safety. He didn't say, what? And what did I get myself into? Boom, in the middle of the night, they're up and they're gone. You know, he, he was, the things that we hear are, are few, but every single one of them show him to be of a good God, godly character, and I believe he was. So, yeah. Okay, so again, with this, this blessing then, that final blessing, the inheritance rights that come from it, the prophetic statement, it would show God's supernatural power at work. Only God could call out who he was choosing and what they would be chosen for. So um, Jacob, Jacob's blessing, the earth blessing they got, you know, the, that was bountiful. He would have more than Esau. But Esau was also promised blessing. It wasn't that he was totally left out. We'll see that when we look at the blessing that he received also. Um, when we read that Esau complained, he took my birthright. Now he's taking my blessing. See, they were two different things. The birthright was that position, that authority, and all that goes with the family name, I'll say. And now the blessing is the earthly, bountiful, and looking at the you know, future and what's coming. And again, he does receive, he begs for it, and he does get a secondary blessing. It's a lesser than, if you want to read ahead, it's chapter 27, verses 38 to 40. But uh, he did not, um, he, he never wanted the birthright. He never shows a heart that wanted the birthright. All that we see is a heart that despised the birthright. Um, we see with, with Yaakov himself, when he's blessing his two grandsons, Yosef's two children, Ephraim and Manasseh, Ephraim and Manasseh, he put a, his hand on, um, let's see, yeah, on, the yeah, the younger one, I'm, I, because God was directing him. And the younger was going to be the one brought up into that greater position. Yeah, so, and that's uh, chapter 48. We'll get there in a while, too. And when Jacob blesses his 12 sons, Reuben is the head. Reuben is the first. But he's not the one given the birthright. He forfeited that because of his sin with his mother's um, handmaiden. So, and that's in Genesis 49, and that's also in 1 Chronicles. Genesis 49, 4 in particular, and 1 Chronicles 5, verse 1. Now, what I thought Patty was hint hinting on, hitting on, whatever, say it right, um, with Yeshua is another very important point. We hear and we read in Scripture, Yeshua is the firstborn son of God. Now, we all know God didn't give birth to him. We know that Yeshua never had a beginning as God. In the beginning, God created, and it's Elohim. God the Father, God the Son, we know the Spirit of God moved on the face of the earth. Before our earth begins, he is there. We know that the scripture says, for unto us the child is born. The son's given, but the child is born. So how can he be called firstborn? What does it mean? When God says he's the only begotten son of God, what does that mean? What we're talking about here is a position. It's a rank. The same way that the, this one who would receive birthright usually being the oldest, would receive that position of authority, that position of ranking. They would be head of the family. And what they said would carry the authority of the family. 
in this way, Yeshua is receiving the kingdom from the Father. Remember he says, sit here until I make your enemies your footstool. When he does that is at the end of the tribulation, Yeshua comes down and sets up his kingdom and the war is over. There's a thousand years of peace. So he will receive his kingdom from the Father. We're talking the, the, the coming down to earth, the earthly. Right now he is at the right hand of the Father on a throne built for two. Okay? They're equal. There's no inequality. There's no inferiority. There's no less than. And there's no beginning. Oh, here's the day that God created Yeshua. No. No. The only thing that was created for Yeshua was a human suit. A <laughs> human body. He slipped in, into a human flesh suit, whatever you want to call it. That's what was prepared for him. And it was prepared by the, the move of the Ruach Kodesh over Miriam's womb. So that he was created, his, his human flesh was created miraculously, not by earthly sperm meeting female egg and the normal reproduction. This was so that he would be born without that sin nature. So he would be 100% God, while at the same time he was 100% human. Again, can we fully comprehend? No. But can we fully comprehend that God created the world out of nothing? Can we fully comprehend that God keeps it all in order? Can we fully comprehend anything around us? No. No. So this is where our faith steps in until we have the mind of Messiah ourselves, and then we will know and understand. Let me show you in Scripture Him being the firstborn, the Son of God, and what this means. Go with me to Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, and verse 29. Romans 8 and verse 29. My tablet's slow. Maybe I'm slow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Romans 8, 29, where we read, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among the brethren. Again, we're talking position. Those that God predestined to become the sons of God first come into that position through faith in Yeshua and Jesus. That's how they're conformed to the image of the Son. In our faith, when we accept Yeshua and Jesus as our Savior, we are conformed into His image. He, being the first raised from the dead, shows that position of rank, that position of authority, that position of power, able to give abundant life to all who follow him. So following him, he is the, the firstborn, the preeminent position. Colossians 1.15 backs this up. Colossians 1 and verse 15, where we read, He is the visible image of the invisible God. That's who Yeshua is. Yeshua is God with skin on makes him visible, okay? Remember our three pieces of matzah in the, in the time of the Afikoman, uh in our Passover Seder? Remember that one piece comes out into view, the other two are never seen, and we know it's the middle piece, it's representative of the sun coming into view. How did the sun come into view? When he took on human flesh, when he came onto this earth, being born as a human being, not as God. He never was born as God. He always existed as God. So here we have that same thing. He is the visible image. Do you want to know what God looks like? Look at the sun. Even, Fire. even, <laughs> I'm sorry? Fire. Fire. <laughs> even when Philip said, show us the Father. And he turned it to Philip and he said, have I been with you this long and you don't get it? <laughs> yeah. I and the Father are one. Okay, we're finishing this verse, it says he is supreme over all creation. He is the firstborn over all creation. He is the authoritative position. He has that highest ranking. He is above all the rest. That's what's being said. And Revelation 1.5 also attests to it. We've got the mouth of three witnesses right here saying the same thing about our Messiah and Savior. Revelation, whoops, I went to one. Revelation yeah, I did want one. Sorry. Revelation 1 and verse 5. And we read, And from Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, 
the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is the first one to come back to life and live forever. That we know. That's fact. The others who raised from the dead by his power, Lazarus, anyone know where Lazarus is today? Does he live in Israel? He lived in Bethany, Bethany. Is he there? Do we have a 2,000-year-old man on this earth? <laughs> and you're all shaking your heads. No, 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 no. Of course not. He died again. In his flesh, he died again. His spirit, of course, went to be in the presence of the Lord. Uh, but what we are seeing is that Yeshua is the first one to raise from dead, conquer death, the power of death over the human being. And we see the human, perf I can't say perfected, because he was perfect. But we see when he raised from the dead, he still could eat. He went through the walls. If I go try to go through that wall, I'm going to get a headache. <laughs> I'm not going to try it. But in my perfected body, when I get the body that is my eternal, I will be able to go through the walls. I will be able to instantly be wherever the Lord wants to send me to do his beck and calling. Now, God's only begotten son, receiving the kingdom from his Father, who is Lord of all, is where we read in Acts 2. So go with me to Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. This is part of Kepha's On Fire sermon. Who does it sizzle? Love it. Read it, and, and especially if you know Jewish history, boy, he just nails it. Talks, brings it down thousands of years and nails where they're at in that day. In chapter 2 and verse 36 of the book of Acts, he says, let for, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know. Know for certain in one text. Know beyond a doubt in another text that God, Yehovah, God, has made him, Yeshua Jesus, both Lord and Messiah, this Yeshua whom you crucified. Okay, he's made him both Lord and Messiah and Messiah. That's his position on this earth as he is the Messiah, he is the Savior, he is Lord over us all, those of us who come to saving faith. Philippians 2, we're familiar with the, the verses that tell us that he humbled himself, that he made himself of no reputation, that he was willing even to suffer the death on the cross, but let's read a little further. Verse 9, for this reason also God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name. See him in the high ranking, highest position. He's the highest of, uh, that there can be. So that at the name of Yeshua, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Those who are in heaven, those who are on earth, those who are under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Yeshua HaMashiach is Adonai is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's got top billing, folks. He is the top human being. He is the top rank in the heavens, on earth, under the earth, wherever. He's in that top position. That belongs to him. It belongs to God the Father. They share it because the two are one. Um, let me show you Revelation 19.16. Revelation 19 and verse 16. Revelation 19, 16, we read, and I love it, on his robe and on his thigh, and this is when he's coming down out of heaven, he's going to stop the battle of Armageddon and set up his kingdom. On his robe and on his thigh is a name written. It's not a wimpy name, folks. King of kings, Lord of lords. Can he get any higher? Can, is there any ranking above that? No, no. In our vernacular today, he's top dog. Okay, he's the cat's meow. <laughs> he's that more. And beautifully, he promises to share his kingdom and his inheritance with us. That's where I thought that we were going a few minutes ago too. Romans 4.13. Yeah, he, what's he going to do with this? Um, it's all his, it's been his, he created it, so it was his from the beginning as creator, it's his in first ranking position as human, it's his in position first as God. In Romans 4.13 he says to us, 
For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So Abraham is going to receive something not because of the law, some inheritance that's because of his faith. His faith made him righteous. So he's going to receive a righteous inheritance because of his faith in his God. We're beginning to see what that is as we talk about it. Um, I'm not going to do it here in Romans 4. Let me take you to Galatians 3. I'm putting it, the whole thing together for you, but go and read all these verses and, and the surroundings and you will see it's all it's speaking the same language. Galatians 3 and verse 29. If you belong to Messiah, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendant, heirs according to the promise. So when he promised Abraham in chapter 4, if you're in Abraham's family, then you get to come into those blessings also. But remember, it's not talking about an earthly, physical family. It's talking about spiritual. It's talking about a righteousness in the robe of Yeshua, Jesus. Go with me to Ephesians 1.18. Ephesians 1.18. You're getting an exercise through your Bible books today. <laughs> Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. And this is a sure hope. That's not a I hope so. This is a no so. What the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So the saints are his inheritance and in him, when we become a part of him, we receive his inheritance also. It's being adopted into the family. And oh, by the way, even in Roman law, an adopted son brought in would receive everything that, that the unadopted, <laughs> the natural born sons would receive. It, they were not second class. They were not left out. They came in entirely. And if they came in into that position of first, they got the <clears throat> double portion, you know, the... Of course, Roman wasn't doing a double portion, but you get my point. You know, they were fully accepted and fully received the blessings. Hebrews 11 and verse 16. I love the fact that God doesn't have any grandchildren and he doesn't have any exclusions. I love this one better than that one. Even when he said it about Jacob and Esau, we've looked at what that reason and what he was really saying, what it means. Hebrews 11 verse 16, but as it is they, and this is referring to Abraham and his, those with him, they desire a better country. Remember Abraham was always on the look. He looked for the better city. He was looking for a city whose founder and maker was God. He was looking for a city that, that the foundations were not on this earth. And here in verse 16 it says that, that they desired a better country that is a heavenly one. They were looking for heaven as their eternal home. And God says, I'm not ashamed then to be called their God because I've prepared a city for them. We know that there is the heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem that is the home of the saints. We, that's part of our inheritance. Now, Mosaic law stipulated the double portion for the oldest, for that one that, that comes into it. God promises abundant blessings. And he talks about Yeshua being firstborn over all creation. So it says if Yeshua gets the double portion, but we also come into his blessings. I think we read Colossians 1.15, but I'll read it again as we go back to it. You might remember it. You don't have to look it up if you don't want. But again, in Colossians 1.15, it backs up what I'm saying from this point of view right now. Also, that he is the visible image of the invisible God. He is supreme over all creation. So he, where the scriptures indicate that he is the blessed one. He is the rightful heir of all things. It all belongs to him. And then Yeshua, who was appointed heir of all things, this is what he says, what he does. Okay, Hebrews 1 and verse 2. Because we know now it all belongs to Yeshua. He, he is the head, he gets the double portion, he gets the bigger blessing, he actually gets it all. But in Hebrews 1 and verse 2, it says, In these last days he, God, has spoken to us in his son, in Yeshua, whom he appointed heir of all things, makes it clear, through whom 
also he made the world. So basically, Jehovah, God the Father, is saying, Son, you created it all. It's yours. Guess what, son? You inherited it all in your human humanity in that first rank position, so it's all yours. Double portion. Double blessing. Double his. Okay? Psalm 2, 7 and 8. We have it even in the original scriptures. And Psalm 2 is very messianic. If you don't know that, read it and you will see that it's speaking of the Messiah, the anointed one. Messiah means anointed. It leaves no question who it's talking about. Psalm 2 verse 7 says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He's decreed this. He's said, thou, you know, God says, this is it. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. And then it says he's going to rule them with a rod of iron. He's going to rule the earthly nations. This God has blessed him with the earthly inheritance in his earthly humanity, even though he also in his godly position, it's all his. So it's just showing you on both levels it is his. God has given it to him and it is his he is appointed heir of all things and what he will do with it is whatever he wants to do with it just as the oldest son could could do and lead the family and they didn't have a say they had to do what god said they had or what the older one said they had to follow his lead thankfully we've got god for our lead the son of god for our lead is how i should phrase that matthew 28 and verse 18 says Yeshua came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. All authority in heaven and on earth. Now through his grace, for by grace are you saved through faith. So through his grace, in our faith, we come into a relationship with him. And that's where we are called his joint heirs. Do you realize what your future holds for you? You're inheriting everything with the Son as your head. Look at Romans 8, 17. He doesn't take it all and say it's mine and have a selfish nature in it. No, he, he's amazing. We don't deserve that he freely chooses to give. Romans 8, 17. If children... Um, maybe I need to back up. Let me back up because uh, remember I talked a moment ago about adopted sons receive the same, you know, they're equal. They are not looked at as less than. So in verse 15 we're told we're not, we have not received a spirit of slavery so we should fear again. But we've received a spirit of adoption as sons by where we cry out, Abba, Father. We can call Jehovah God in heaven our Father because through the Son, being, being one with the Son, inheriting with the Son, He is our Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, verse 17, And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Messiah. If indeed we suffer with Him, we may also be glorified with Him. That's amazing. We become joint heir with